been an interested hobby of mine. Um, I had some training in infectious disease and didn't know what to do after that, and there was an opening to run the admitting ward out at the TB hospital called Furland on the north end of Seattle. So I went out there for about a year and a half, and that's really where I learned about TB and also became interested in lung disease. But classically, all the lung doctors were trained in TB sense, so I'm the very last of the lung doctors that were trained uh, that way. And, and I was able to grandfather in for my boards and that kind of thing later because of my training. Uh, this particular slide was actually uh, taken when Lawrence and I were over in Afghanistan. This fellow was just admitted for a hip fracture, but it's quite common in third world countries that an incidental diagnosis would be tuberculosis. So uh, it gave us more than one thing uh, to approach treatment. So where did the word consumption come from? We don't really know. Uh, it's a biblical term from Deuteronomy. It, it sounds like it could be TB, um, with fever, inflammation, and fiery heat. And TB has probably been with us pretty much from the beginning, uh, as far as we can uh, look historically. Uh, they've now, with uh, uh, DNA testing, uh, been able to find it all the way back 9,000 years with typing of the tuberculosis, they think maybe the, uh, that some seals, not Navy seals, but seals <laughs> brought it into South America from Africa. Uh, definitely proven in Egyptian mummies. Um, but of course, we didn't know the science of TB. It was just a historical illness. Hippocrates called it thysis. And it wasn't until the 1700s that uh, Benjamin Martin thought it might be due to wonderfully minute living creatures, uh, that all this era that uh, predated uh, Pasteur and modern uh, bacteriology. Actually, in the 18th and 19th century, uh, TB found its way into music and opera. Uh, somebody said, what would great opera be without tuberculosis? <laughs> uh, the, uh, but it was considered almost a romantic disease. So if there was a power involved and a weakness and frailness involved, and it was almost stylish to have the uh, disease. Uh, treatments were really uh, all conjectural. Uh, the king's touch was very important. Uh, the king got his powers from God, and, and th thus he could heal you by laying out of hands. And this is an example of that, the ill being brought in for their healing. So the king's touch was an idea. People said, no, you should close the windows. Or people said, no, you should open the windows. Uh, should drink blood be in a warm climate or at seaside, in the mountains, horseback riding, sea voyages, or drinking either human or animal milk. And there are a lot of tragedies related to families uh, with tuberculosis. It touched my own family when my aunt developed tuberculosis and her three children came to live with us and my poor mom had uh, six of us under age six uh, for a while. But can you imagine the Bronte family uh, mother dies of TB at age 38, and then serially children developed tuberculosis, and several of them died, Emily at, at 29, and then Charlotte at age 39. Well, Reverend Bronte lived to be 87 with a diagnosis of chronic bronchitis, and I gotta wonder if he didn't have tuberculosis and give it to the rest of the family. Uh, because it is a disease that's communicated not readily, but in a closed environment where you have daily exposure, that's where your risk of uh, TB uh, comes from. And so it's been around with us uh, for a long time. Um, you recognize these uh, famous names. Uh, Chopin, uh, when he died from tuberculosis, asked his physician uh, to please take out my heart because actually Chopin's heart was removed and taken off to Poland and it's a, in a uh, church there that is a, a visitor site. One of my friends who's a musician actually wrote a book about Chopin's heart. He was theorizing that Chopin died from 
cystic fibrosis, not tuberculosis, but uh, they've actually done a biopsy of that heart now, and uh, he did not have the cystic fibrosis gene, so he no doubt died of tuberculosis. El Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, when I was in New York, she passed away uh, at a very elderly age. They actually missed the diagnosis on her. She had uh, tuberculosis that spread as her immune system dropped, TB spread through her bloodstream and it was in all of her organs and she had kind of a wasting illness, but uh, that wasn't really diagnosed until autopsy. Um, does anybody remember the Mariner shortstop who had tuberculosis? Where's Tom Gibbs? <laughs> uh, it's Carlos Guillen. Not too long ago, he presented to the emergency room in our hospital coughing up blood. And he's actually fairly typical of the way TB would present in the United States. Now, somebody who's pretty healthy but had TB uh, as a child, it's laid dormant, but as their um, uh, as their life progresses and they went into a period where their immune system drops down then the TB can reactivate, uh, usually in the upper portion of the lungs. Uh, cavities can develop, it can erode into arteries and you cough up blood. The nice thing about TB now is we have good drugs for it. And actually none of the mariners converted their skin test to positive. So he was not all that infectious even though they traveled and roomed with him. The science of TB really didn't begin until the mid-1800s. Uh, a French doctor, Bellman, uh, demonstrated that it could be passed uh, by, from humans to cows to rabbits uh, by injecting the infected material. So the, the race was on. How are we going to find uh, TB at the organism? The proof was by a very remarkable uh, German, Robert Koch, who was uh, well-educated as a physician. He graduated top of his class. And he set up a lab right next to his surgery clinic where he, he practiced medicine. And he was determined that he was going to figure out uh, a way to um, diagnose tuberculosis. And he actually was able to grow it in culture. He was able to inject it in guinea pigs, show the findings in guinea pigs, grow it from the guinea pigs, and so this what's now called Koch's postulates for infectious disease. He's really the father of infectious disease, and he presented his paper uh, to uh, the top scientists of the day, and he brought his lab right into the lecture hall uh, and had them go around and look at his specimens, look at the cultures, and nobody had ever seen TB before, but he had figured out a way of staining and at the end of this lecture, there was no applause, and people simply got up and went and looked at the microscope. It was, it was, re he was really the father of infectious disease, and he went on uh, to uh, identify cholera and anthrax also as illnesses. So, an absolutely remarkable guy. Um, the, uh, he also introduced photomicroscopy, and appropriately, he got a Nobel Prize uh, later in his career. So what are we going to do with TB? Now we can identify it, but how are we going to treat it? And in Europe, the TB SANS uh, became popular. Um, Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain kind of describes uh, TB SAN and illness and dying. Uh, Trudeau in the United States had physician with TB went up into the Adirondacks and seemed to get better at high altitude. So this is where the sands seem to start. But those of you who are in nursing or medicine uh, know that there was a lot of exposure and 40% uh, of nursing and medical students became infected if they weren't already uh, during their training. Uh, there just wasn't good knowledge of prevention. And actually uh, it was not unusual at all in a nursing or medical student uh, class to have a few drop out from active tuberculosis. And in those days, you would go to a TB SAN for a year or two or three uh, or, or more if you survived. BCG vaccine. Uh, I was lined up in medical school and said, you guys are going to get this vaccine. And uh, we just gave our arm and got this shot of uh, 
a vaccine. It was developed in France, actually, uh, by these two physicians who took a bovine strain of TB and kept putting it in cultures, finding the weakest organism, putting that in a culture. And even while the Germans were invading Paris, they kept their cultures going and came up with this uh, vaccine. There's a lot of controversy still about its efficacy. It's never been widely used in the United States, although I was reminded by somebody that it was used in Alaska because of the outbreaks there. It's still used quite a bit around the world, and uh, there are like 17 vaccines under investigation now, so there's a, a brand new interest in worldwide uh, use of TB vaccines. So for, prior to drugs, what did we have? They would use total bed rest, and the idea of resting the lung seemed to help it heal, so they actually collapsed the lung with air, pushing air in and collapsing the lung, or sometimes taking ribs out on that side to collapse it. Isolating patients, beautiful precautions. Uh, some people are more infectious than others, particularly people with big cavities in their lungs with lots of bacteria in their sputum. Coke mistakenly thought using the protein might be therapy, but that didn't work. Gold and other therapies were tried uh, unsuccessfully. Uh, actually, that's where they figured out gold worked for rheumatoid arthritis. They were using it in TB hospitals, and the people with rheumatoid arthritis got somewhat better uh, by accident. So I don't know if you remember these days of the war on consumption. Uh, the TB symbol is still the double bar cross of Lorraine, and uh, uh, you'll still see it on the, on the uh, Christmas seal stamps. This is the initial treatment of tuberculosis, fresh air. So you raise the bed and put the head out the window, which I thought was a pretty innovative approach to treating a child. And this is a collapse therapy where you put a tube in between the ribs and then pump air in to deflate the lung. Notice the sterile technique here with the uh, gloves and masks <laughs> being absent. But uh, anyway, that's the way it was done in those days. This is a phenomenal lady in terms of fundraising, uh, Emily Bissell. Uh, she led the Easter Seal campaign and uh, or Christmas Seal campaign, and it, it still goes. This is one of the first uh, Christmas Seals. There were some kind of weird uh, posters that came out, like when a llama spits, gets where he spits. So I, I don't know, but anyway, they were trying to do sputum control and keep the spittoons out of the barbershops and that kind of thing. So what about King County? We were felt in the early 1900s to be a tuberculosis swamp. Yeah, we had one of the highest death rates uh, in the country from TB. We had a lot of crowded housing and no real precautions. So the Anti-Tuberculosis League was formed in the early 1900s. Uh, Horace Henry was the head of that. Nurses were hired to survey, um, and the idea of uh, that a TB sand should be built for isolation. Initially, it was supposed to be up on Queen Anne, but the residents marched with broomsticks to block a pest house from being in their backyard. So that fell through as did the idea of building a children's hospital on Queen Anne. But Horace Henry came through. Uh, he was a, a wealthy philanthropist whose son died of tuberculosis at age 18. So he was one, a, a very motivated person to um, be active in that area. He donated 34 acres of land 12 miles north of downtown, um, which is now Krista Ministries, if you've been out there. That, that was the old um, initial for a beautiful building that it still stands. Um, and the TB, uh, and a TB League turned that over to the city. So that opened in around 1914. It was really out in the country. I mean, Aurora Avenue wasn't even paved. It was, a, it was kind of a dirt road going north from there to get out to the TB hospital. So getting supplies in there initially was not easy. Some smaller sands were, were built, like uh, the Morningside sand uh, down in Georgetown. 
And these are these wonderful visiting nurses and the type of housing that they would go out and find the uh, TB cases. Uh, urban dwelling with crowded housing is, uh, and, and poor nutrition, um, those things are the things that make uh, TB so prevalent. Uh, this is Horace Henry, at the Henry Art Gallery, it's named for him. Uh, all kinds of activities went on at the sand. Uh, this is interesting. Bed rest was so important that even a chapel on Sunday here, I, I think is the pastor. This is probably staff or visitors. And the patients that were at bed rest had to sleep up on the stage here. Not sleep, but lie flat, because bed rest was strictly, strictly enforced. This is in the era before drugs. There is some scientific evidence that bed rest might work. This was published just recently in 2003. But when you lie somebody down, it does decrease the amount of oxygen in the upper lobes of the lungs. Uh, and since TB is there, uh, lower oxygen pressures tend to suppress the growth of TB. So that may be why uh, it works. If you could lower it all the way down to 10% in guinea pigs, it suppresses. So, that was just an empiric observation that bed rest helps because they had not much else, but it, it really did seem to have a significant effect. Once the drug era came along, bed rest was no longer important. We used to play volleyball out of Furlan with the TB patients, so you know, once they're on drugs, it's not a big deal. So does anybody remember the Navy Hospital out there in 175th? Oh, yeah, a few hands go up. That was decommissioned at the end of World War II. Uh, it was supposed to be temporary structures, kind of little quonsonite type structures. And they, uh, that, the problem they had with TB then, that the nurses were so successful in finding the TB cases that the old furlough just simply couldn't accommodate them. <coughs> so suddenly we had about 1,500 beds at the, at the Navy hospital that could be used for TB. And so they had, well over, they had to move all the patients from from uh, the, the uh, Richmond Beach area over to the, the Naval Hospital, which became the New Furland. It was one of the biggest mass transfer of, of patients anywhere. So that was successful, and uh, they kept looking for more cases of TB. The uh, mobile, any of you ever stepped in on one of those mobile vans and get a TB screening? Uh, it used to be pretty routine, and it wasn't until 1948 that, that we really had any drugs at all to treat tuberculosis. This is the way the sand looked in 1937. A lot of these are off of the history link site on the web. Um, so that thankfully is a wonderful resource if you're ever looking for Seattle history. These are the uh, type of, of uh, President says that we had just long wards with uh, multiple bunks uh, that uh, with very little privacy uh, in, in between the in, in between the bunks. These are now torn down. Actually, I took this picture kind of stuck in there before they were demolished. These are the kids. The idea that fresh air was good, um, and uh, that's the first snow. Um, and uh, th this was taken out of the old furlough, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. Anybody read The Egg and I? <laughs> now, Betty McDonald also was a patient at furlough, and she's written a funny book, uh, but really very descriptive, called The Plague and I. And uh, uh, here she is signing some copies of, of her book. It's a good read. Actually, both of them are, are fun to read. The, these are the. I think this was from on, up on First Hill, uh, somewhere near Seattle. You, um, the uh, the old bands were lined up, and you go through and get your annual chest X-ray as part of the screening. Um, Interesting things were done at Furlan. A lot of research. It, it, it became a teaching hospital for the university. I always, we were the major chest hospital at that time. We did more lung surgery than any other hospital in Seattle. And uh, downtown surgeons would uh, come out to Furlan and operate. Um, 
and there was a researcher named Tom Holmes who was very interested in stress and illness. And he's the one that came up with this psychosocial factors uh, in terms of illness. He, he got this idea from the down and out nature and stress factors in the life of people that reacted, uh, that reactivated their tuberculosis. So the home scale of points you can add up for stress factors in your life. Anybody that moved in here probably had a lot of points during that move. I know we did somehow. Somehow we didn't get ill, thank goodness. But there were about 62 papers published by firm researchers. So a lot of drug trials and other things were going on out there. And this is Tom Holmes, who was on the UW faculty. TB era finally, the drug era finally began. Selman Waxman uh, developed streptomycin and uh, administered first in 1944. And then fairly rapidly, uh, PAS, isoniazid, this one's called PZA, perizinamide, ethambutol, and then a big one in 1963, rifampin. Then there was nothing for about 40 years. So we, we TB research and drug therapy just kind of went away. There, there wasn't really any funding or any real active interest. Uh, Waxman got the Nobel Prize uh, for his discovery of streptomycin. <coughs> And uh, I think I went through this, and we had a good physiology lab at Sherman, and even Harborview would send us out their slides to confirm uh, tuberculosis. So it was really an active place during those years. It was a little community. Uh, we had not only chapel, we had graduation for high school students at Furman. Uh, there were marriages that occurred. Uh, the medical director would write a very stern letter in his monthly newsletter that came out trying to keep the sexes apart, which was always a challenge. <laughs> they, this is their, their Furlan monthly publication. There, if you ever want to look at them, they're at the Shoreline Historical Museum uh, out on the 145th. And it's really fun to go through these because there were no HIPAA rules in those days. You got admission and discharge and who was on who and you know what, what they didn't like about the menu and everything else. So, um, this is the last patient to leave Furlan in 1973. That's, that's when it, it shut down. And everybody thought, well, gee, you know, we take care of TB. Yeah, it's still around the world, but, you know, we don't really need to worry about it much anymore. But um, it's still around. Uh, in, in King County, about two cases a week are diagnosed. Uh, that's no cause for panic for any of us. The, Majority of the cases are in foreign born. Somebody who was born overseas became infected as a child, quite healthy here for a number of years, and then for whatever reason their immune system drops and they reactivate through tuberculosis. And it's by and large easy to treat. We have a good TB clinic right down here at Harborview, uh, good nurses and, uh, and directly observed therapy. So I wouldn't worry about TB in yourself. It's, it's kind of uh, uh, be very unusual to have a problem. But it is around the world, and that's what I'd like to talk about a little bit. Um, in the 1980s, uh, when we kind of began to forget about TB, there were new epidemics in, in all the major cities. And it was, it was for a couple of reasons. One, that all the sands had closed, the interest in TB had declined, and HIV came along, and the, the, we didn't have drugs in the early era of HIV, and uh, I saw a number of deaths of uh, patients with HIV. And the problem is by destroying your immune system, if you happen to have latent tuberculosis, uh, you can die of TB in just two weeks. It, it's an, it can be an amazingly aggressive disease in, in somebody who has full-blown AIDS. With the AIDS being now treated and controlled, uh, it's not as big a problem with TB as what it was initially. TB in Russia and Russian prison system is a real mess. They, they just did not have good control. They had crowded conditions. They had poor treatment regimens. Uh, they didn't follow WHO guidelines. And it's still a problem there. 
And the world epidemic really continues. A third of the world population is infected uh, with TB. The, uh, this is where the multiple drug resistant TB, the problem when you don't treat TB properly, uh, the current regimen, you start with four drugs and then you drop down uh, if it's sensitive uh, to two drugs, but you need to treat uh, at least um, for six months. And if you go try to drop down to four months, it's not as good. So it, it's a complicated therapy. We can't just give it and send somebody out and have them take it on their own. Directly observed therapy has been proven really the only way to prevent inappropriate taking of antibiotics and, and the added tuberculosis drugs and then developing resistance. So what about Seattle research? There's a lot being done in this town. Uh, this is an amazing city when you really think of what's going on here with the Gates Foundation funding and the infectious disease research going on. Seattle Biomed apparently has been renamed or renamed itself the Center of Infectious Disease Research. They have a 30, 30 million dollar budget and their focus is on the big three, uh, malaria, HIV, and tuberculosis. Those are the three major diseases that they're focusing on. Uh, the Infectious Disease Research Institute uh, has developed vaccines with Smith. They're, they're in kind of the second phase of their trials and uh, they're collaborating with others uh, toward TB drug development as well. And also PATH uh, locally supports TB testing and treatment and the Gates Foundation went down to Stanford and hired the best TB expert in the world and he's headed of their TB program, a guy named Peter Small. So we've got just wonderful resources uh, right here that are, are working out and, and a lot of that is uh, thanks to the Gates Foundation and their funding. Uh, one of the real problems with tuberculosis has been the difficulty of making the diagnosis. Sputum cultures can take four to six weeks to grow. So how, and then you have to turn around and do sensitivity testing to see if the antibiotics will work or not. And uh, there's a new test that has been developed called the, uh, it's a commercial one, but it's good, it's called Expert. And they can simultaneously detect TB and rifampin drug resistant within two weeks. Uh, so you can get appropriate treatment and diagnosis to people much quicker than we, we could before. Uh, I'm sorry, two hours, not two weeks. So you can be offered proper treatment on the same day. Prior testing took weeks. So very rapid uh, testing using molecular uh, amplification techniques. Uh, it, it's expensive, but it's worth it if, if we can get adequate funding into the people out on the front lines. These are the challenges, though. I probably should have started with this slide. Nine million people around the world develop TB each year. Uh, 1.5 die each year. 1.5 million people are still dying. We are beginning to get faster identification. Uh, we need multiple funding store sources to make this less expensive. There's still lots of barriers out there. The, the, the biggest re sources of TB in the world are, are India and China with their huge populations and difficult public health systems. Uh, the, uh, so those, that's why the Gates Foundation sent Peter Small to, to India to, to try to get their programs going and Gates Foundation has a separate office in Beijing with 